Well, I'm, I'm Luke. I'm one of the pastors here. If I've never met you, hello. I'm so thankful to be here with you today. And uh, we got some ground to cover, and I'm very excited about what we have in front of us today. Uh, now, when I got here this morning, it was cold, but I understand that it's now hot. Is that right? So that's long, how long of a day we've had in church, and you're going to get hopefully the best part of it. Now, have you ever noticed that sometimes people say things to you, and uh, even before they're finished coming out of their mouth, you know it's not true? You know, so it's like, it's just, it, you know, like, like when the government tells you when something's going to be done, you know, we're going to fix this road and it's going to be done by X, you say, well, no, no, it isn't, you know, no, it isn't. Or uh, if, if someone starts a conversation with you, uh, this happened to Pastor George today, actually, if someone starts a conversation with you and they say, now, I'm not trying to sell you anything, but just tell me, front to the back, what are they trying to do? They're trying to say, you know, now, if you ever find yourself uh, on a date with somebody and then, uh, well, if you're a young lady and you find yourself on a date with somebody and the guy says, now, I'm not, I'm not like all those other guys out there, you know, you know what you can be sure of? He's just like all of them. Yeah, you know it. And we say, sometimes people say things and you just, you know, it's not true. But maybe more than any of them, it's this one. Do you remember this from when you were a kid? Uh, that little kind of nursery rhyme thing that people would say about uh, sticks and stones? Yeah, you remember that one? Sticks and stones might break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And then we had this one uh, that we did back, I don't know if you, some people maybe don't, did you, you know the one about the rubber and the glue? Do you remember that one? Yeah, so you know when you, someone would say something mean to you, you'd say, well, I'm rubber. And your glue, whatever you say, you know what it does? It bounces off to me, off of me, and it sticks back. But I got to say, I got some things that have stuck to me over time in life. And we wildly, wildly underrate we wildly underrate the power of our words in relationships. We're, we're in a series, in fact, on relationships. Uh, it's been kind of, some of it's been about romantic relationships, and lots of the rest of it has been about just the way that we are, you and me, together, in friendship, and at work, at school, whatever the things are. And what I want to draw our attention to today is the power of our words and what our words can do. I want to do it from the book of, the book of Proverbs. Uh, where we got it was from this, this proverb. It, it captured my attention. It's, we're going to bounce around a bunch of them, but it started here in Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 19. This scripture says this. It says, When words are many, transgression is not lacking. But whoever restrains his lips is prudent. So if there's just a lot coming out bup, 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 of your mouth and out of your keyboard and out of your tweet book and all the rest of it, if there's a lot coming out of your mouth, one of them, somewhere, sometime, eventually, often, it's going to be wrong in the sight of God. It's going to cause damage and hurt. Where there are many words, transgression is not lacking, but... The prudent person guards his, his lips, restrains his mouth. That word there, prudent, doesn't just mean is pleasing to God. It also means makes things better for themselves. Things work out better for you. Things work out better for me when I hold back some of the things that I want to say. Uh, there's three titles to the message today. You can pick one, the one that works best for you. The first one is uh, Five Proverbs you may not be listening to. Try that, okay, okay, we'll see what that. The second one is, maybe don't talk so much. <laughs> the third one is, the power of verbal restraint. That you can't believe how much better your life gets your relationship with your heavenly father and your relationship with the people around you, especially the people that you care about most, you can't believe how much it improves when you restrain your lips. This is all going to be taken from the book of Proverbs. And Proverbs, they're sayings. The book of Proverbs is filled with generally true statements of wisdom for you and for me. Proverbs are not promises. Proverbs are not things that are always true every single time. Proverbs are ideas and concepts that when applied to my life in the right way and at the right time, help me make good choices in healthier relationship. 
They're not promises. Here's how we know. Look at this one. This is Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. Check this. Proverbs 26, 4 and 5 says, answer not. All right, she's got it. <laughs> answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Next verse, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. So which, is, is the Bible like setting a trick here? Is it a trap? Do you need to use like a magnifying glass? How do you, what? Answer a fool or don't answer a fool? Answer a fool or don't answer a fool? The answer is, I think it's clear. What's the answer? It depends on the situation. It depends on what's happening at the time. Sometimes the right thing to do is to answer a fool. Sometimes the right thing to do is to not answer a fool. The point is, is that I must pay great attention. And when I see Proverbs, I should apply them to my life in a way that makes sense. Now, when we're surveying the book of Proverbs, you need to make super clear that you're on this. You don't want to be the fool. You don't want to be the fool. You want to be the, the person of understanding, the son of wisdom. That's the person you want to be, the person who applies. All of Proverbs is about wisdom, and wisdom is not knowledge. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. It is not. Knowledge puffs up. Some of the biggest fools I ever met had lots of information in their head. Wisdom is the application of knowledge properly to my life. And the fool is the person who knows, hears, but doesn't do. You can be in church every Sunday your whole life and be a fool if you don't apply what you know. So here we find five things in the book of Proverbs, and all of these are towards the power of verbal restraint. You here? You with me? We in? All right, well, you're here, so we're going. Number one, number one, number one, number one is stop yapping. Stop yapping. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 2. Proverbs 18 and verse 2 says, A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. And you know the ladies are happy that this is framed like it's a man who's the fool. You know that's true. So the fool takes no pleasure. That word there, pleasure, that word there, pleasure, is, is the idea of delight at the moment of wow. Has this ever happened to you where a few pieces of information all of a sudden come into your, and they kind of put the puzzle pieces together and all you're like, oh, I understand. I understand. It's when you watch a young person playing sports and all of a sudden they can, they can do things the right way. It's the moment of wow. It all just clicks into place. Maybe at your job, you've had that, oh my, all of a sudden, I know how to do this. The moment of understanding when the pieces all put together. The fool does not enjoy that. So I'm just, is that, that what the text says. Am I making this up or is that in the Bible? The fool is not happy when they figure things out. The fool is only happy when what? The fool is only happy when you are listening to them talk. The fool is not interested in a conversation the way that, you know, a normal human being would be, which is the exchange of information towards better understanding. The fool is only interested in the moment when it's their turn. So let's just say I'm having a conversation with Pastor George, and I'm, well, okay, here's what we'll do. You're the man of wisdom, Pastor George. I'm the fool, all right? Yeah, come on. Yeah, you're the man of understanding. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You're stewarding. Yep, you got a great jacket on today. You're, you're the, so you're the man of understanding. I'm the fool. So we're having a conversation, and whatever it is that we're discussing, maybe we're di discussing politics, or we're talking about the Lakers, or we're talking about the stock market, or whatever the thing is, that doesn't matter. But if I'm the fool, the entire time that he's talking, I'm not hearing the words that he's saying. I'm thinking about what I'm going to say, and then the moment. You know people like this. I mean the second he pauses for a breath. So the thing I wanted to tell you about Kobe Bryant is, well, let me tell you, Pastor George, what I really think. And off and off and off and off and off and off I go. The fool takes no interest, wait, no pleasure. They don't have any desire to understand what you are saying. They only see relationships as a place to say their opinion. And this was written before social media existed. So we do better in our relationships, you and me, 
when we stop yapping and start listening. We start listening. A long time ago, uh, when my wife and I were dating, she was here at the last service, and so I told the story more delicately the last time because she was here. And uh, so, when, when we were dating, uh, one night we, we, uh, she said a word to me describing the way she thought I was acting. And uh, this, the, I'll show you the definition of the word. Put it up there. So the word is defined as having an irritable disposition, cantankerous, difficult to deal with or control. Now, she was probably right, but that's not what was happening in the story. And she said the word. She said, you're being really right now. And I said, well, I appreciate that, lovely, beautiful young woman that I'm dating. But, but you didn't say that word right. You, you, mispr- you mispronounced it. And she said, well, mister, you think you're so smart. I did say it right. And I said, well, yeah, I understand that, you know, you, that you're a beautiful cheerleader and I'm just some schmo and you're dating me and so I should go along with everything that you want me to go along with. But you are saying that word incorrectly, lovely girlfriend of mine. And we went back and forth getting more and more and more mad. And the word uh, is ornery, which has a second legitimate pr- uh, pronunciation, which is ornery. And those are both correct, according to the dictionary. And here's the funny thing. We became the thing we were arguing about <laughs> while trying to prove to each other that we were right. We spend so much energy and attention and desire to trying to figure out how to get our words heard that we don't realize that most of the good stuff happens in relationships when we're listening, not when we're talking. So stop yapping and watch your relationships improve. Second one, stop venting. Stop venting your raw feelings. Look at this, and I'm, whoa, that, did you feel that just like ripple out into the room? <laughs> Proverbs 29, 11. And I'm not talking about any particular people in the world, so just be careful now you start applying to me things I'm not saying. All I'm saying is what the scripture says, and you let the chips fall where they may. It says this, the scripture says that a fool, what what are we laughing about? A fool, a fool, you know what a fool does? A fool gives full vent to his spirit. But a wise man quietly holds it back. Full vent is the idea of all the breath all of the emotion. What a fool does is they, you know that thing at the end of the Super Bowl where they dump like the bucket of Gatorade on the coach? The fool goes around doing that about whatever they're feeling to pretty much everybody they're talking to. They say, hello, how are you today? You know how I am? Let me tell you. (laughs) Most people can't handle all the things that are going around in that head of yours. Most people can't handle it, don't want to handle it. Most of us have some things that we think, have some things that we feel that no one should ever have to hear. But we live in this world now of instantaneous communication, and it's just so easy. You fire off a text, fire off, you know, those emails, all caps, like 20 exclamation points. It's like, why are you screaming at me? You know, thing. Without thinking. And relationships get broken because of it. The fool has very little gap between what they feel and what they say, has very little gap between a thought coming to their mind and tweeting it out for the universe to read. The fool gives full vent to their spirit. The wise man holds it back. We see that Jesus personified this perfectly. In John 2, it says that Jesus did not entrust himself to man because he knew what was in the heart of man. Jesus never had a feeling that wasn't a feeling from the Spirit. Jesus walked in perfection all the time. But even Jesus knew that every single thing I'm feeling right now, it's not gonna be helpful to the other person for them to have to hear it from me. Very few relationships, very, very few, very, very few can handle all the things that you have going on in your mind and your heart every day. Here's uh, this a poem, I think, that perfectly describes. There's just a few relationships like this. Pastor Luke, you know poetry? Well, I know this poem. Which says, oh, the comfort, the inexpressible comfort 
of feeling safe with a person. Having neither to weigh thoughts nor measure words, but pouring them all right out just as they are, chaff and grain together. Certain that a faithful hand will take and sift them, keep what is worth keeping, and then with a breath of kindness, blow the rest away. There's just a very few relationships in your life where people can hear what you're really thinking and feeling and then say, you know, she's having a bad day. I think I'm just going to forget that ever happened. I have a dear friend. A dear friend. We have a lot of life that we've lived together. And he said something when I was really down earlier this year. He said something that was so hurtful to me that every time I hear his name, every time I see his face, every time he comes across my mind, the first thought that comes to my mind is not the 10 amazing years we've had as friends, all the great times we had. The first thing that comes to my mind is when he said, I just, and here, you know what's crazy? He apologized. And I forgave him. And I don't want to think about it anymore. But it still comes across my mind because we, you and me, you know what we do? We don't realize how powerful the words are, especially when a person's down, especially when a person's vulnerable, especially when things aren't going their way. You can do more damage to their heart than a hammer to the head could do to their body with the words that you say when you drop out a full vent of your spirit. The wise person says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to feel this for a little while and then decide what part of it is actually worth while is actually useful to bring to another person. Stop yapping, stop venting. Three, stop shaming. All right, now, Proverbs 11, 12 and 13 says this. It says, whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense. But a man of understanding remains silent. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing. What's the next word? Love covers sin. Love's desire is not for every bad thing that happens for everybody to know. Love's desire is any time we can, we keep it covered and hidden. It is so often the case that we shame other people in their moments of weakness rather than cover. That idea of belittle is to mock, to show contempt for, to say harsh things in regards to. And the idea of a neighbor is not the idea of the person who lives near you that you never talk to, like we might find some. The idea of the neighbor there is your friend, a person you're in community with, a person that you're in close proximity to. The person who mocks, who says hurtful things about, who exaggerates, you see there in the second verse, who exaggerates the problems of a person close to them is causing great harm is causing great pain. It's a good thing that church people <laughs> never, never do that to each other, you know, because we're, we're just A plus in that regard. We all have this tendency. You just stop me if I'm saying that it's something that isn't the truth. You just, you just stop me right here, all right? Now, we all have this tendency to start talking can you believe what that girl on the choir was wearing today? Did you see the way they were letting their kids act? Did you see the car that he bought? There's no way that he can afford to drive a car like that on the thing he made. He rolls up in here like with a Tesla, like he runs the place. No, he must know. He's going to go bankrupt is what he's going to do. Did you, can you believe, can you believe, can you believe that she's already dating? I didn't, they just, didn't it just, did, could you, she's all right. On, you know she didn't even got those kids under control, but she's back on the, uh, wait a second, did you, now nah, did you hear, did you hear, did you hear they're splitting up? Did you hear they're splitting up? Did you hear? I know why. You won't believe what he, you won't believe what he did. Come here, let me tell you, you won't believe what he did. You won't believe it, you won't believe it, you won't believe it. And it goes on and on and on and on. And there's this temptation inside all of us that we all deal with to pull down someone near us so that we can feel just a little bit bigger. And it should not be in the church of God that we are like that, but it's a temptation. And I'm not, being, I'm not trying to be condemning because it's something we all deal with. It is so easy to think that a few words over here are so innocent. And what we don't realize is if you've ever had the moment in your life where you realized 
that they'd been talking about you. You, you realize that they'd been, and, and, and you overheard, it came back to you. There is nothing quite so, boom, is realizing that people you thought you could trust weren't trustworthy in regards to the difficult things you were going through. And the way that it goes is, so let's just say, you know, me and Pastor JP are over here, and we're, we're just, we're talking about Pastor George. Can you believe Pastor George this, and can you believe he this, and can you, who does he, you know, and we're, I'm just, let's just say it's me, and I'm just going, Pastor George this, and this, and this, and you can, and this, and this. Now, here's the thing that happens, is when Pastor JP walks away, if he has any wisdom at all in his heart, he says, now, I wonder what Luke says to George when I'm the one who's not around. And sometimes, you know, we do the, we do the thing, now, ooh, okay, ooh, uh, I don't know, I don't know if we can, can we, I don't know if we can handle this one. Now, you know, have you ever done the one, been part of the one, where it's a prayer request? Now, I just think we need to pray for sister so-and-so. You, you, all, you all know the problems she's had. And well, I just, I'm just, I'm just concerned for her heart about this guy that she's dating. I just, well, I just, I, I just think we need to pray for her. Okay, you know what? Pray for her, fine. But do it away from everybody else. You don't need to be bringing a bunch of other people into it as though somehow it's like this virtuous thing. And the, and, and the girls do it in one way and the fellas do it in a different way. And it's not that. It's just simply this. Just throw that text back up there for just one second. Proverbs 11, 12, and 13. With that in mind, let me read it to you. Whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense. You know why? It's a what goes around comes around, what you sow you're going to reap kind of thing. But a man of understanding remains silent. That means you have the chance to say the thing, but choose not to. Whoever goes about slandering, slandering then we've brought in the idea of now we're not just saying what is true, we're adding on to it to make the story even better. Reveals secrets, but a man who is trustworthy keeps a thing covered. The loving person, the loving person, can see the failure in another and choose not to need to talk about it because of love. The loving person says, it's not my job, it's not my job to tell everybody. It's not that they can't see it. It's not that they pretend it isn't there. It's that if I have something to say to you about what is going on with you, I am going to say it at the right and most loving time to you and the rest of the time I'm gonna keep exactly quiet and in fact, if it's somehow I hear something going on about it, I'm just going, you know what, guys? It sounds like she's going through a rough time right now. Maybe the most loving thing we could do is not have another conversation going on about it or whatever the case may be. Amen. Now we see two more. The next one, stop fighting. Stop fighting. This is Proverbs 15.1. I love this. Proverbs 15.1 says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The idea here is this. When you fight fire with fire, you just make bigger fire. Now, I don't know about, I have honestly, personally, like perfectly harmonious relationships that are, that are free from conflict really in any way. But sometimes I've heard that, that those who choose to get married have conflict. Occasionally I've heard that the saints have a little bit of conflict together. And when conflict arises, you have two options. Option one is to give the answer in the manner that turns up the heat. And option two is to give in the manner that turns down the heat. Now notice, notice that the idea is not, it says a soft answer. So the answer is still in there. This is not, and be super clear, be super clear. This is not, if you are uh, being abused, you don't just, the soft answer isn't to lay down and do nothing about it. If you're being abused, you should call the police. If you're being treated in a harmful, sinful way, you should call the church and get the church to help. It's not, that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about when in relationship, there's a conflict I should always be thinking, what is the way in which I can give my perspective that makes the conflict less intense emotionally right now and allows us the most opportunity to hear each other? You know that sometimes in conflict, the noise becomes so loud that the words can't even be heard anymore. 
And this is called Washington, D.C. <laughs> where the way that we talk makes it impossible for anyone to hear the words that each other is saying. And that's the straight truth. And so what the wise person does is says, now, okay, now we have to have this conversation, but I'm going to say it at the time and in the way when I can be in such control of my emotions that I don't, need, I don't make it harder than it needs to be by the way that I say it. Because sometimes the way that I say it causes more damage than the thing that I'm saying. And you always know, you know, yeah. You know that something bad is about to happen when a person says, don't blame me. It's the truth. Whether or not something should be said has to pass through more markers or checkpoints than is it true. Some of the most damaging things that can happen to a person are someone telling you the truth in a way that devastates and destroys your soul. You can tell the truth in the wrong way. You can tell the truth at the wrong time. You can tell the truth from the wrong motivation. You might be the wrong person to tell the truth to the person. Just consider that for a second. I, it's, uh, try it this way. Um, you can be wrong even if what you're saying is right. You can be wrong. Let's try it this way. If, if you're wrong in the way that you're right, you're still wrong even if you're right. That's a, try to get your head on that one. Who's on first? Right. If you're wrong in the way that you're right, you're wrong even if the facts are on your side. There's more to it than just the facts. Uh, the perfect picture of this is Jesus. Uh, John 21. John 21 might be my favorite story in the whole scripture. You don't have to turn there, but it's this. Uh, John 21 is the very end. And Jesus, this is kind of like his last, one of his last shots with the disciples. And he shows up, and Peter's there. And this is the first time they've seen each other since Peter. Do you remember he denied Jesus three times? One, two, three. Strikes you out. And Jesus has the opportunity. Now he's, him and Peter are going to have a, a conversation now, Jesus is 100% in the right in this relational breakage. Note, just as an aside, that any time there's a relational problem, you should be very careful to never find yourself 100% in the right. You can always find something that's your part, except for if it, you're in a fight with Jesus. If you're in a fight with Jesus, I got news. He's right. You're wrong. So Peter's denied Jesus, and Jesus shows up on the scene, and now they're going to have this conversation. And Jesus, he has him dead to rights. Jesus has every right to show up and say, I said you were going to do it, and you said you weren't. And then you went out and did your own thing and see how it worked out. Now you're back in the stinky fishing boat, and I'm here standing, now, not dead anymore, alive. And now what do you have to say for yourself now, Peter? <laughs> and if Jesus had decided to do him like that, would he have been inside of his rights? He's the Lord. If he does it, it's right. But what Jesus does is he pulls Peter away. You can see it right there in the story. He pulls Peter away. Now John sort of tags along to write it down. Classic, like, overachiever. The teacher, you know, you didn't collect our homework. He's got to, like, write, you know, make sure he's got everything just right. But what Jesus does is he pulls him. Am I telling the truth? He pulls Peter off to the side to repair their relationship back so that Peter is still esteemed in such a way by the rest of the disciples that he raises up and is the leader. Not six weeks from when this thing happens, Peter leads 3,000 people to Christ through his powerful sermon. Because Jesus did not enhance the negativity of, his, of Peter's reputation in the eyes of the disciples. No, he put him back together in a way that protected his reputation. A soft answer turns wrath away. When negativity comes toward us, we don't have to respond in the same way. Just because they're saying it to you in the wrong way doesn't give you the right to say it in the same way back. This is, we see this, Jesus did this perfectly. First Peter says it like this, that Jesus, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't say, just wait and see what's going to happen next. But continued entrusting himself to him who, just, who, in, who judges justly. Justice is coming our way but not through our words. Justice is coming our way because there's a God who is watching it all. And he has all kinds of power, all the power needed to restore and to put things back the way they're right. And so often we want to use our words to say, no, 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 let me tell you. When God would say, I got you. 
I got your reputation. I got the whole thing. Jesus himself was willing to say, I trust the Father to avenge. So stop fighting fire with fire. The last part of a soft answer is a soft answer is as much about understanding as it is about the way that you talk. Often one of the reasons why our relationships get so broken is that we think that we have to agree to understand. You can understand and affirm someone's perspective even if you don't agree with it. And part of a soft answer is being willing to understand what the person is trying to say to you. So here's where we've been. Stop yapping, stop venting, stop shaming, stop fighting. And lastly, and there is good news, so don't worry. Stop rushing to issue a verdict. Look at this one. This is Proverbs 18, 17. Oh, I'm about to, so you don't be worried about that. <laughs> Proverbs 18, 17 says, the one who states his case first, everybody just say that next word. This is the most important word here. The one who states his case first, come on. Until the other comes and examines him. The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. So uh, I have three elementary school age kids, uh, uh, all boys. And uh, it goes the same way. So I'm you know, sitting in the other room. I'm scanning through my phone. I'm reading the Bible. I'm reading the Bible. And, uh, <laughs> and, and you, you hear them before you, you see them. Here they come. Dead, 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 dead. Okay, so this is what happened. This is what happened. This is what happened. This is what happened. I was just holding, he was, okay, he, he stole the ball from me. Carter stole the ball from me. And I was just trying to grab the ball. I was just trying to grab the ball. I was just trying to grab the ball. And I reached for the ball and he moved the ball. And well, okay, my hands did hit his face. And it was like a slap, but I was not trying to slap him. It was his fault. He took the ball from me. And, uh, it, and then just about then, just about then, here comes. No, Dad, no, no, no. That's not how it happened at all. That's not how it happened at all. That's not how it happened at all. It was my turn to play with the ball. It was my turn to play with the ball. And he just, he just slapped me. He just slapped me, Dad. Are you going to let him do that? He just slapped me. And right about then, the third one, the little one. The th it's always the third one comes a little. Dad, no, no, no. That's not how it happened at all, Dad. That's not how it happened at all. That's not how it happened at all. He was mean. He took the ball. And then he was mean. He slapped him. I think you should send both of them to your room and let me play with the ball is what I think you should do, Dad. This way. It goes. Every single. Pray for me. If you think I tell that story with a lot of clarity and detail, it's because that happens, like, to me. Like, three times an hour. Every hour of every day, and it hadn't stopped yet. It's, I never taught them this verse, but there's something in the human nature that intuitively listens to the first person they hear from and intuitively wants to make their voice, their voice heard. The other, the one who states his case first, what is it? Seems right. Seems right. Until the other comes and examines them. Just because something seems something doesn't mean it is anything. Just because something seems something doesn't mean it is anything. Just because something seems doesn't mean it is anything. And I've been through this. I've been through the feeling of people saying things about you that aren't true and the damage that it's causing and people who don't know any different, they say, well, it seems like that must be what's true. And the feeling of what can I do to fix it? Because if I just start fighting fire with fire, it just becomes a whole big, ugly, nasty thing. And I just, you know, I just want to be left alone. I just want to go on. And that, that there's something, there's just this pain that comes when your reputation is damaged because of things that people say and it feels so powerless, you feel like there's no safety because it's like there's nothing I can do to stop it. Anything that I do is just gonna make it worse. And I just, I just, and it's, it's if you've been there, if you've been there, it's so tough. You see it in the way that parents treat each other when they split up and there's a kid involved. They're talking, 
way they're talking. You see sometimes the stuff that happens at church, you see it in, man, you can see it in the workplace where there's the boss and he has the, he can just say, the boss can just say that this is what happened. And it doesn't matter that I, even though I work there, it doesn't matter. I didn't, it's not the way he says, but there's nothing I can do to stop it because he's the boss. Just because something seems a certain way doesn't mean it is a certain way. And you know that it makes me think of Jesus. Because on the night that he was betrayed, he was taken into court and he was convicted. Just because a place that's supposed to do something, a place of justice, does something doesn't mean that that's justice. And when the court convicted him, it seemed like to the people around, well, he's guilty of blasphemy, I guess. I guess he's going to die. Then when he was brought out, if you know the story, it was, okay, we're going to choose now. Who, which prisoner do you want to be released? Do you want Jesus or do you want Barabbas? It seemed to the crowd that based on who was yelling and who was yelling the loudest. Have you ever noticed that the people who yell the loudest usually get to win for a little while? A little while, a little while, a little while. And so it seemed, it seemed, it seemed. Like the best thing to do was to the crowd was to say, Barabbas, Barabbas, Barabbas. So then Jesus was, was flogged. And he was beaten. And he was punched and kicked and whipped and stabbed. And it seemed to the people doing it like they were just doing their job, like they were doing the right thing. Just because it seems like it's the right thing to do doesn't mean it's the right thing to do, to whip and beat and to flog. And then Jesus went to the cross. And when he went to the cross, he had this astonishing thought that he said to, do you remember this? He said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. He knew that they were doing what seemed right in the moment, but when he would be revealed as king was not right. It seemed like the right thing to do. And then, <laughs> and then he died, and it seemed like it was over. And, and Friday, and Friday they went to bed, and it seemed like all hope was lost. And all the plans that they had made, and they dropped everything, and it was like, we're going to follow this guy. And he, they had seen him heal, and they had seen him do miracles, and they'd seen him raise a man from the dead, but now it seemed like everything they had invested was wasted, and it was over. And then I always think about that Saturday. Like, that must have been the saddest day that this world has ever seen. They woke up on Saturday, and I'm sure you know they checked. Is he wait, he's still dead? And it seemed like everything that they were hoping in was lost and gone and not going to happen. And they went to bed Saturday night, and it seemed like everything that they had ever wanted was now broken and gone and never coming back. But then early Sunday morning, it seemed like something has changed. It seemed like something is different. It seemed like it's not exactly the way we thought. It seems like, because do you remember how the story starts? Do you remember how the story starts? It starts like the, the word starts getting out. It's the lady first, because you know the ladies always have more faith. It's just the way it is. The ladies have the most faith. And so she was there, and the tomb is empty. And she runs and tells Peter and John, and they sprint off. Peter and John, they sprint off. They're going to go find out. And I always love the part that John has to make sure he writes in the Bible that he got there first. So they're brothers like my boys. And they get to the tomb, and there's, this is the moment. Now, it seems like something has changed. But do you remember their first instinct? It seems like someone has stolen the body. It seems like. And then they realized that what had seemed over was not over. Because we're not a God that operates based on what seems like the verdict. The verdict was dead, but no, now he is alive. He's alive. He's alive. And so today to you, my dear friend, it doesn't matter what verdict has been passed over your life. It doesn't matter what it seems like. It may seem like they're never coming home. It may seem like you'll never love again. It may seem like this battle will never end. It may seem like the trial will never stop. It may seem like the doctor's words are the final words. It may seem like a lot of things, but it seemed like Jesus was dead, and he was not dead. He was alive.
And so we don't speak our words, we don't speak our words trying to make it get to the way we think it should be. We don't speak our words into seems like. We speak our words into the God who has final justice, final authority, final approval, and he says, no matter how dead it may seem to you, I am alive, and because I am alive, you are going to be alive too. So close your mouth, close your mouth, restrain your lips, don't say things that make it worse, because I got you, and I got it coming, so just wait, and eventually you're going to see when we make it to the end, I have the victory. Come on. Come on, death could not hold you down, say. 